If there's one console that stands above everything else, it can only be the Sony PlayStation 2. First announced in 1999 and released in October of 2000, the PS2 would ultimately sell north of 150 million units and to this day is still the undisputed leader in terms of sales. It kickstarted many successful game franchises such as God of War, Ratchet and Clank and GTA 3 to name a few, but its architecture would be heavily criticized and written off as too complicated. Many developers initially struggled with the system, favoring the GameCube, Dreamcast, and later the original Microsoft Xbox. Many would label the PlayStation 2 as weaker compared to the competition. But the competition would follow a more traditional approach to their architecture, and in the case of the original Xbox, was all but a PC with a custom Windows kernel that ran x86 code. The PS2 on the other hand, was a completely different animal. The system would be powered by the Emotion Engine, a high-tech processor that offered unprecedented gaming power, which was said to be twice as fast as a 733 MHz Pentium 3, the same processor that powered the original Xbox. The Emotion Engine could handle 75 million 3D transformations per second. But tapping into this performance would be very challenging, with many developers complaining about the PS2's complexity. In the year 2000, Shinji Mikami worked at Capcom and was very vocal about the difficulties on programming the PS2. Sony provided an extensive library with PlayStation. The library would do a lot of work, but with PS2, there is no library. We need to create our own library, which poses its own set of problems in that there are so many choices to achieve the same effects. But this was only one aspect of the PlayStation 2's complexity. The Emotion Engine, or EE, was of course the heart of the PS2 that contained a 64-bit MIPS R5900 CPU running at 291 MHz. It also came with 24 kilobytes of L1 cache, 16 kilobytes of scratch pad RAM, which was also known as fast RAM. It contained an additional 32 128-bit registers and for the first time on PlayStation hardware would include two dedicated 128-bit SMID floating point vector units known as VU0 and VU1, each of which was able to process massive amounts of data per cycle. The Emotion Engine's job was to generate display lists or rendering commands and pass them to the GS or Graphic Synthesizer chip a custom dedicated 3D accelerator that renders all of the display lists that it's received from the EE. The IOP or IO processor handles all the controller inputs, USB communications, and informs the Emotion Engine that there is a new controller or input states to process. What's really interesting about the IOP chip is that if it's not being used to handle IO on PS2 games, it's running PS1 games in back compat mode. You see, the IOP chip is a duplicate of the PlayStation 1 CPU. Hardware-based backward compatibility would be a staple in earlier Sony hardware, and this approach to having a dual-purpose chip would ensure that all hardware chips were being utilized. The PlayStation 2 would also come with 32 megabytes of RD RAM. But the chip that really made the PS2 a powerhouse when used correctly would be the DMA controller known as DMAC. When we talk about traditional DMA, its job is to move data around very quickly and allow the CPU to do other work. The DMAC was a custom developed chip that's connected to the 32 megabytes of PS2 RAM and all peripherals and allowed data to move around extremely fast. Optimizing data flow on the DMAC is one of the key components to fast PS2 games. And in many cases, the DMAC actually does more work than the CPU. In order to send data to any of the coprocessors, first a DMA data transfer must be established with the device being signaled, then the data can be sent to it. Now to some people, this may sound familiar. In many ways, the DMAC was the first iteration to what would become a very important piece of architecture later on when Sony released the PlayStation 3. 
DMA transfers to each SPU on the PS3 cell architecture would be crucial to getting the best performance out of the PlayStation 3. So when we talk about the PlayStation 2, developers really had to think differently in order to get the best out of the machine. Gone were the days of a large block of VRAM and large caches. The PlayStation 2 had a very small cache size and pretty small VRAM. So developers really had to start thinking about different ways to optimize and tune their games in order to take advantage of all the custom PlayStation 2 chips. Compared to PCs and the competition, the Sony PlayStation 2 was a different animal. Its architecture was complex yet innovative and introduced a paradigm shift to how games were made. The concepts of parallelism quickly became the goal. The emotion engine and both vector units running together processing instructions at the same time would be the main target. If developers could figure out a method of keeping all the PS2 coprocessors fed with a constant stream of data without any stalling, they would hold the advantage. But this would be very difficult. Developers were well versed in traditional development on the PC and indeed the Xbox and GameCube, all of which had powerful processors. They also contain north bridges and large caches, with enough memory to store large chunks of GPU data and execute them in batches. On the PS3, this approach simply would not work. The PS2 contains much smaller cache sizes than the PC. The Emotion Engine contains only 16K of instruction and 8K of data for its caches. Sony's thinking at the time was these caches didn't need to be any larger due to the constant stream of data moving in and out of cache. Initially, developers struggled to make sense of the PlayStation 2. They would think about 3D graphics in terms of a large block of RAM to store models and textures. The PS2 forced them to rethink how to move data around the machine. The VU vector unit caches are too small to store an entire model worth of data, and the same applies for textures. Data would need to be streamed in constantly keeping the processors and cache fed. The same applied for the PS2's graphic synthesizer, which required parallelism in order to fill its 16 pixel pipelines. And this is where the important DMAC chip would come in. Its 10 channel capacity would be important to ensure the constant flow of traffic from one processor to the other. And while the PS2 had very small caches, what it does have is bandwidth and lots of it, wide enough to move data around the bus extremely fast. Architecture complexity is one thing, but how do you educate your developers on this? There were many reports that Sony's development kits for the PS2 early on were woefully primitive. With little to no documentation, it would be next to impossible to educate developers on anything close to good performance, and it would be left to developers to write their own libraries to perform their tasks. This meant that early on, there would be an iterative approach to development on the PS2, with the mentality of traditional PC games development. In other words, games were developed using the CPU and floating point units to feed RAM and send geometry and texture data to the GS, bypassing the VUs. Then developers would become more aware of the vector units and began to understand them. The next step would be to introduce VU0 and process instructions in parallel with the CPU. This alone could speed up rendering instructions by 1 million polygons per second. VU1 could then be introduced to implement lighting, animations and other effects all in parallel and move these systems from the main CPU. This had the goal of touching every coprocessor in the rendering pipeline, all in a streamlined parallel nature that the PS2 expects. A typical game developed in this way could output as much as 10 million polygons per second. While many games were ports that did not take full advantage of the PS2, some games were exclusive or initially released for the console, and some of these were technically brilliant. Games such as Ratchet & Clank, Gran Turismo 3 and 4, Shadows of the Colossus and Metal Gear Solid 2 really showcased the power of the hardware in the right hands. Metal Gear Solid 2 is one that I always go back to. The tanker level outside when Snake is running around is quite impressive, running at a lock 60 frames per second with the rain and physics effects going on at the same time. This is the subtle power of the PlayStation 2 hardware. As a comparison, the OG Xbox port shows noticeable slowdown in the same areas, 
yet the hardware is much more powerful. Another area where the PlayStation 2 beats out the competition is the fog in Silent Hill 2. Taking advantage of VU1 and the high fill rates of the GS, the fog effect is brilliant. On the original Xbox, the fog effect is diminished, looking more like a smoke machine at times. It's just not the same. In the right hands, the PS2 was a masterpiece, but it needed plenty of hard work to get there. So it's very interesting to go back and revisit this stuff because although we know about the architectural challenges that developers had with the PS2, it ultimately ended up being the most successful console of all time. With an estimated 3,000 games made for the system, developers really got in tune with how games were made. And the concepts around parallelism was something that Sony had introduced with the PS2, but it was brought forward to the PS3 and I think that whole idea about parallel development was really something that became more mainstream in video games over time. But at the end of the day, the PS2 is a very interesting and unique system to go back and look at. And it's one that I've really enjoyed covering on the channel. But for now, we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to put a like on it. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.